Alright, so this is my response video for Warzone Media Arts. And there is so much to address in this video. It is unbelievable. Um, I don't know if I can make a full video addressing it unless it would be like 30 minutes long. So what I'm going to do is cover the main points which I think would be really important to do. What would be better to do is let's just set up a debate on Skype or something and hey, let, let's, let's talk it out. I would love to do so. So let's do this really quick. Off the bat, I am not a sin sinless perfectionism or Christian perfectionist or anything like that. I Sinless perfectionism and Christian perfectionism believe in total depravity and original sin, which I deny to add to my heresy. And also that teaches that once you become a Christian, you will still commit sin, but eventually will reach a point of complete sanctification. No, that must happen at salvation. You must, as Proverbs 28, 13 says, he who confesses and forsakes his sin shall find mercy. So you must confess and forsake your sin, then you shall find mercy. Then you were making it seem like, okay, since I can stop sinning, I guess the cross doesn't matter anymore, which is not true. We need the cross because we have a record. We've all broken God's law, Romans 3, 23. We've all sinned. We all have a record. We've all done it. So Christ, we need because... As, as Matthew 1, I believe it's 21, it says that Jesus Christ, they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So as Jesus Christ came to save us from our sins, he, as 1 John 1, 9 says, his blood cleanses us from all our sins, all the sins we've committed. Romans 3, 25 says all our past sins, not future. When it says all, it's not referring to future. It's saying all the sins you've committed and that way we are pure and holy before God because our, our records wash clean. Then we follow God in obedience. Now the one thing I really want to jump on is your 1 John chapters 1 and chapter 2 thing because I think that is probably one of the most important things because here's a little secret about me. I believe 1 John 2 three through six is undefeatable. Every single time I bring it before Christians, they have zero answer. Scripture stands there and condemns them. And I'm gonna, we're gonna go be going through chapter one to show you that how I, how chapter two makes sense. Otherwise, if you are interpreting chapter one as you are, it completely messes up the entire book and the rest of the Bible. So we're just gonna jump right into that. So I think like your first argument, it was something like, you underlined the line that said that upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. It was something weird, so I don't even know how to address that because I have, I have no idea how you see proof that uh, we can't be sinless with that verse. Um, number four you brought up, verse four in chapter 1 John 1, 4, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. I do not understand how that is also proof of being sinless. Um, that your joy can be complete, I I don't understand. But your real blow you tried to get me with was 1 John 1, 8. And I really wish you have done more research on my channel because I have like the most common questions people ask me and that one is like the number one verse that's always brought up to me is 1 John 1, 8. And you will have looked on my channel, you would have seen that I have a response video for it. So. I wish you would have watched that, so now I'm going to be kind of repeating the same information, but I think it'd be good. I'm actually pulling out my PDF of this. So, let's look at 1 John 1 8, where it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. I mean, who can say they have no sin? No one can, because all have sinned. Romans 3 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. To say you have never sinned would make you a liar. Now that we have come to this conclusion, let's continue to read. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins to God, which true confession includes forsaken, which is Proverbs 28, 13, he will forgive us and cleanse us from all, all, remember that, unrighteousness, making us clean, pure, and right before the eyes of God. Then as we continue to read in the second chapter, we are told that we need to keep his commands and walk like Jesus walked. Now with your interpretation of this verse, you believe if anyone says that they are without sin, they are a liar and the truth is not in them. But when you look at the next verse after that and try to make it make sense with 1 John 1 it 
turns into this giant mess. And let me show you. So, if you say you have no sin, you're a liar and the truth is not in you, alright? But, if a Christian confesses his sins, God is faithful and just to cleanse him from all his sins, all unrighteousness. So, all his sins are gone and washed, clean. Completely washed, completely clean, 100%. And since he's washed 100%, he's violating 1 John 1 8 because he's without sin. Christ washed him from all unrighteousness. So now he's violating 1 John 1 8 and he's a liar and the truth is not in him. And so that means Jesus Christ can't wash you from all your sin. Because if he does, you violate 1 John 1 8. See how it's that never ending paradox right there? I mean, really look at it. If I say I have no sin, I'm a liar, the truth is not in me. So if I confess my sins, Jesus is going to wash me of all my unrighteousness, so I probably shouldn't confess my sins, or as I violate 1 John 1 8. So it's completely silly, completely foolish argument. It is so out of context, especially with the verses right before 1 John 1 8. I mean, look at it. 1 John 1 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, as He is, as God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. So, so, so don't play this thing where, oh, if I say I have no sin, I'm a liar. I'm a liar. I mean, that, then, then it violates the rest of the chapter. How do you make sense of 1 John 2, 3 through 4? I mean, how, how does that apply with those verses? All you really have to do is just block 1 John 2, 3 through 4 out. Don't block it out, oh, because of 1 John 1 8. So we don't really pay attention to those verses where it says, By this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. I mean, think about it. It clearly states that. I mean, it's almost like you guys just can't grasp it. By this we know that we know him. This is your sign. This is this is this is how you test yourself. I mean, 2 Corinthians 13, where Paul says, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Here you go. First John is all about testing yourself. Do you keep his commandments? He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. So are you keeping his commandments? Obviously, I don't think you are. I, I'm not gonna assume. But let's just say you are, then you're, then you're a liar and the truth is not in you. Simple as that. Or 1 John 3, where it says, He who sins is of the devil. It's, it's very clear. Now you might pull the, Oh, well, 1 John's written to Christians, so obviously he must be referring to Christians. Which means they're still living in their sins. If you actually look at the context of the letter, he was writing to the Gnostics of the day. Which means he was writing to the people who believed that they were completely sinless since birth. Completely sinless, 100% since birth. That only their, like their, their flesh would sin, but their spirit never did. And like there was this weird separation thing. And so he's writing to them, if you claim that you have never sinned since birth, you're a liar. You're, you're lying. The truth's not in you. You've obviously sinned. But, now since we've come to that conclusion, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us from our sins and wash us from all unrighteousness. I think I'm mis misquoting that. Also, something weird you said. You said in 1 John that he said that Christians will continue to sin. If we actually look at chapter 2, it makes it clear that he definitely did not say that ever. He says, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. But if you do, the if, if, if you do, it's not when you do, it is if you do. So obviously your the prayer thing with Jesus is completely messed up and really pulling it out of the verse and adding your own theology to it. Because he, he clearly says, if you sin, we have an advocate. It's an if, it's not a when. So they might not sin. If you sin, we have an advocate through the Father. If you don't sin, well, you don't need to worry about it because they're living in holiness. See, we do have an advocate if we sin. It's not just completely hopelessness. We do, but we also do lose separation from God. I believe it's Hebrews 7.26 where Jesus is separate from sinners. It's 1 Peter 3.12 where it says... The, 
God does not hear the prayers of the wicked. His ears are turned away, but his ears are towards the righteous. He hears the righteous' prayers. So really think about what I just said. Examine the scriptures. How do you make sense of 1 John 2, 3 through 4 with 1 John 1 a? And I showed you that paradox. That crazy paradox you have to believe if you believe that verse is speaking about anyone who ever claims to be sinless. And then also, that would put John the Baptist's parents in that complete circle. Because if we take a look here at Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 6, it says, There is in the day of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. They were righteous, keeping all the commandments and all the ordinances of the Lord. Completely blameless, completely righteous. Are they a liar and the truth is not in them? They were able to keep all the commandments. They were able to stop sinning. How come you can? How come John the Baptist's parents could? Examine 1 Corinthians 10.13 where it says that every single temptation you have to sin, God gives you a way of escape. So you can choose to escape or you can choose to dwell on your sin. You can choose to continue in wickedness, or you can choose the way of escape God has given. But we'll continue on to the next thing. Um, you said that it is unbiblical. Wait, let, let, let's play this. Let's listen to this together. I'm going to turn this up. Because it's so closely tied to false doctrine, I can't affirm it. The irony of this is that those who hold to Christian perfectionism often like to lord their authority over people by causing them to question their own salvation. Ironically, something that Jesus tells us not to do. Jesus tells us not to question our own salvation? Uh, I believe the Bible says to examine our faith. Let's take a look. Um, turn your Bible to 2 Corinthians 13. And we see clearly uh, Paul saying, and I believe, uh, let's see, guys. verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? So, I guess you found a contradiction in the Bible. Otherwise, maybe someone else is taking scripture out of context because Luke 22, who is the greatest, is somehow proving we shouldn't examine our own salvation. <coughs> First, 2 Corinthians 13, 5 clearly says, examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. And then, my favorite book, 1 John 5, we clearly see that the whole entire book these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. So the whole reason of 1 John was for Christians to examine their faith. I think we're seeing the fruit that you are talking about that people bear about their doctrines. But I think it would be best to finally end with this and you telling me to repent, which actually is kind of interesting because what you're telling me is in order for me to come back to Christ and to be saved I must repent and stop doing stuff in order to come to Christ you're telling me to do works you're telling me to stop doing something how dare you haven't you read Ephesians 2 I mean really read Ephesians 2 it says not of works lest anyone should boast I don't have to repent and stop doing things okay I don't I, I don't have to repent and stop and this actually has a lot to do with a video I made before you're calling me into sin I'm living holy I, I, I I'm not breaking God's law I'm obeying him I, I I, I, when I see what is sin, I turn from it and start obeying God. When the Bible says, do not lust, I read it and I obey it. That's what we do as Christians. That's what you're supposed to do. But what you're trying to do is calling me to repent and come back to lying and stealing every single day. Which, I don't want to do that. I, I'd, I'd rather be holy before God. I'd rather live a righteous life in purity. So unfortunately, I, I'm not going to be able to repent and go back into sin. I am freed from sin, as Romans 6 says. But the thing is, you are a servant to whom you obey, as Romans 6 also says. And I don't know, ask you, whose servant are you? 
Who are you obeying? Are you obeying God or are you obeying yourself? Are you still sinning? Well, then you are a servant of sin, as Romans 6 says. If you're obeying God, you're a servant of righteousness. And again, take a look at 1 John. I want to see, maybe you should make a video trying to rebuttal 1 John. That's all I really care about. I want to see you trying to handle 1 John because... First John 1 John 1.8 is actually talking about what I think it's talking about. It leaves you a very big problem with First John 2.3-6.